Okay. I said, why would he say that? Uh, he was a consultant to this study at Rochester. The only reason why he could have said that was that, well, well, he probably didn't see the findings. I think I've consulted on different situations in my past, and, and sometimes you're not shared everything, and maybe Muller didn't know. I said, but did he know? <laughs> and so I, I couldn't tell. So I contacted several people who were historians of science who had their dissertations in areas related to this, some with great details surrounding Muller, and I was unable to get a resolution or an answer based upon their experience. And so at that point, I decided that I had to see if I could tease out any communication between Kasperi and Muller or, uh, or Stern and Muller, anybody who was touching that situation. So I contacted the American Philosophical um, Association that was holding um, Kurt Stern's papers. And then I also contacted the University of Indiana that was holding uh, Muller's papers. And I got um, essentially all their communication between each other from both sides. I didn't want to miss anything. And so uh, about seven or eight hundred pages of, of letters were sent to me. And I uh, came back to my office one day and found that this uh, um, electronic communication had been delivered to my email and sat there um, mesmerized for about three hours going through all of their um, communication. And lo and behold, I found a series of, of letters, starting with a letter from Kurt Stern to Muller in September of 1946, asking him if he would be willing to review this manuscript that they were now having typed that, concerning Kasperi's research. And he said that he would in a follow-up letter. And then um, a bit later, he said it was just about done. Could you still review it? And he said he would. And then on November 6, 1946, he actually sends the completed manuscript to Muller. Now, Muller's already been told that he's going to get the Nobel Prize, and he has to make plans and um, preparations for his trip over to Stockholm. But Muller um, writes a letter back on November 12, 1946, in which he says he has received the manuscript, he's reviewed the manuscript, not in great detail, but he reviewed the manuscript, and that he noted that uh, the findings were striking, that they were uh, challenging the linearity perspective, and that the findings were uh, so significant that they had to be replicated as soon as possible, and that he would provide a detailed criticism, um, hopefully before he took the trip to Stockholm. And so at that point, to me, that was the smoking gun, that Muller actually had seen um, the key study saw uh, essentially its, uh, certainly its essentials, knew that it was a significant challenge. Since he had been a consultant, he uh, had to have been aware that this was uh, a major effort that was being taken, uh, perhaps the, the best effort to date to try to understand the nature of the dose response in the low dose zone. And, and this was challenging uh, his belief in low dose linearity directly. And so, basically, what it told me was that when Muller went to, uh, to Stockholm, he knew what, was, uh, um, what the Kasperi data were. And yet, in light of that, in light of this very large and significant study, Muller um, goes forth and makes a very blatant, uh, unbelievably uh, odd response in which he says, you can no longer accept a threshold model you have to accept a linear, linear model when he had just seen data that actually, the best data to date, that actually totally conflicted with what he said. Now, he may not have believed in um, threshold. He may still have believed in linearity, can understand that. Um, but actually, I mean, here's a guy who is, who is um, recommending replication. Why would he recommend replication at the same time saying you can no longer believe in something? Um, he could have said, well, I think this is still a, um, a disputable scientific question. We need to do more research. But to actually try to say that um, Threshold had no possibility after he'd just seen it, to me, seemed to be uh, some type of an, an act of deliberate deception. So 
I went forth and wrote a paper on this and submitted it to the journal called Archives of Toxicology. And it was accepted and it was uh, published and created uh, um, a, a type of stir. But beside that, I said there was going to be a second paper that was to be published because I think you know that when you, when you uh, make a statement uh, like he did, and it's going to be in conflict with data that's going to be published, at some point, those data are going to be published. And, and then uh, you have your public statement saying that the threshold has to be uh, abandoned, and there's a study supporting threshold. And, and so, at some point, his credibility is going to be undermined because he was a consultant to that study. And so, so the question to me was, well, how did he survive? How did his reputation survive after he made the claim at, in Stockholm and then with the publication of the Kasperi paper? Well, that to me was, was the cover-up. And so initially there was the lie, and then this part two is the cover-up. And so how does he cover up this, this situation? And so, and I, and I realize it's very disrespectful, um, but I don't know how else to, to say this except um, um, that's what it appears to me. And so, uh, in looking... Well, well, what happened to the paper? Uh, did it get published or...? Uh, the paper did get published. It was published uh, in 1948. And it was published... Uh, initially, it was delayed because of um, a clearance by the U.S. government. And then in 1947, um, both papers received clearance. And, and it's interesting that both papers were submitted to the journal uh, Genetics on the same day, on November 25th, 1947, and then published in January of 1948. Now, the uh, interesting thing is that, and this, this will play a, a role in this, the, the editor-in-chief of Genetics was none other than Kurt Stern, the advisor and co-author on both the acute paper, which was with Warren Spencer, and the chronic paper, which was we've been talking about now with uh, uh, Ernst Kasperi. Now, the, the interesting thing here is that if you go back and you uh, begin to look more deeply into this, actually, uh, the, the paper that was sent to, uh, to Muller, and this was the paper that was actually entered into the archives of the, um, the Atomic Energy Commission, and it was a paper that I somehow was able to uncover in the course of my evaluation. Uh, in, the, uh, in the paper that was initially submitted before Muller saw it, um, it had in the conclusion that there was uh, the recommendation for a, or the conclusion that there was a, a tolerance or threshold uh, effect. Uh, after Muller read it, the only change that I saw in the entire very, very long manuscript was the removal of uh, the reference to a tolerance or threshold and the addition of Muller as uh, in the acknowledgments. And those were the only two changes that I saw. Now, in the intervening years afterwards, or time afterwards, um, the, um, the, the research of Stern did try to go back and to um, essentially answer the question of, uh, you know, or replicate the findings of Kasperi. But, but before we get into that, th there is one important thing, and that is that um, when I published the initial, the initial paper, um, there was a lot of publicity associated with it. And one of the criticisms that I got was, in fact, that, well, maybe Mueller um, uh, changed his opinion uh, from the time of uh, he, he wrote that November 12th letter back to uh, Kurt Stern until uh, December 12th when he gave his uh, Nobel Prize speech. He may have thought that it should be replicated. He may have thought that it challenged the perspective that he had. Uh, but maybe he changed his opinion up until, you know, within that five-week period or four-week period. And so, so I was told that I really hadn't nailed it down. Well, as it turns out, I, I did have a January 17th manuscript from Muller in which he actually did provide his seven or eight page uh, single spaced criticism of the Kasperi paper back to Kasperi and Stern. And in it, 
Uh, Mueller actually reaffirms uh, very strongly um, the, his original position that it was significant, that it had to be replicated, but he also very importantly says that the paper was, uh, was done sufficiently well that he had an embarrassingly few comments to make. Uh, so he didn't challenge the, the scientific quality. He didn't challenge uh, any of the findings at all. Uh, he, he actually discussed um, um, how he might have interpreted this. He felt, well, perhaps, um, um, you know, there, there was uh, issues with, uh, uh, you know, for example, Kasperi might have said, uh, did, did claim, well, well maybe, um, the sample size wasn't large enough, even though it was a very large study, and maybe there was a statistical power issue, and he didn't, uh, he didn't support Kasperi's uh, possible interpretation. Uh, then, you know, he, he, he had discussional questions, but, but he couldn't get around it, and no explanation was really um, cogent to try to explain away the threshold. And so, in the end, in my opinion, he throws his hands up in the air, proverbially, and he says, we have to replicate this study. And he says that in January, on January 17th of 1947. So Mueller actually um, did not change his opinion, both before in the time leading up to the uh, Nobel Prize speech and in the time immediately after the Nobel Prize speech. He's locked in to that position saying, that the findings were potentially significant, the findings had to be replicated, and it wasn't a trivial replication. This was uh, getting new funding, this was uh, taking uh, several uh, people working full time for a year to replicate a major study. And so it had to be done. So, and then for him to say at the Nobel Prize speech that, that um, essentially you had to, uh, could no longer believe in the possibility of a threshold, uh, when he's advocating that, it, that this really needs to be done is, um, to me, just misleading and, uh, and advocating an alternative model without being uh, transparent about it is, uh, I, I believe, was uh, a dishonest uh, and uh, misleading to the audience. So, but what happened uh, in the follow-up was, was uh, as important as what um, came before, and that was there was a series of experiments that were done and in fact, um, what happened was that he, um, Kurt Stern, um, brought on a new student, a graduate student, to replicate Kasperi's work. And in the course of it, uh, what happened was that uh, study was completed, and, and in this uh, experiment, the, the control group was aberrantly low. It was approximately 40% below what it should have been. And, and this created a problem because um, um, everything revolves around the reliability of your control groups. You can make adequate comparisons.